Okay, so from that same session, we'll now look at the EEG readings. All right, so this is the raw data from the NeuroSky device. Again, it's normalized, so you can see the color coding here at the legend. Delta's blue, theta's orange. Uh, we're kind of interested in the low bat beta, which is the blue, which is the SMR. Presumably, we don't know the exact frequency ranges on the NeuroSky device, but being that it's labeled low beta or high alpha, we can assume that that's what they're talking about. All right, so once again, we're going to be focused on our ranges here, five minutes, five minute segments. And so the first period would be here. Probably change the color on that. Let's make it a greenish type deal. So the first period is going to be about here. And then the second period, which is the first rest period, is there. And then all the way down through the uh, rest of the graph which we'll look at so we've got these are my from studying neuro sky devices delta and theta amplitudes are always much higher uh, they're slower waveforms so they have a higher amplitude now this is all normalized within a range of zero to one so it's still high in reference to the other values but you could look at it as almost a percentage wise at this point. So we have high delta. This is a normal, I don't, I don't, can't say in super detail, it's a normal brainwave pattern for me, but I see this all the time where it's high delta, high theta, and lower with gamma being the lowest. But again, that is amplitude. That's how the waves are. On an EEG, delta's almost always higher amplitude, theta is a lesser one, and then moving on down the scale. So when you see variances from that is when you're seeing stimulation from this logarithmic layout of the EEG patterns. So it becomes really interesting in areas like this, in areas here where that structure changes a lot and in this session you can see that it is changing along with the patterns itself i'm experiencing a significantly different brainwave pattern during the training periods especially as i move forward and then that period continues somewhat through the rest period with little bits of delta coming into the picture during the rest period but the delta is essentially being suppressed during the the second training period so the second training period starts here at 10 minutes Keep in mind that we start a training period right here, then we have a rest, and then we start our next training period. So in the second training period, my brainwave patterns started to shift quite a bit, and then they carried a great deal throughout the session, which during the rest periods, you can also see that I grab some more da delta. So during the rest period, I was relaxing, getting some delta. Now, I also want you to notice the highly emphasized gamma range, and that all these become compressed around 25% to 50%. 
which is interesting. So you could see the definite pattern there of the structure of my brain waves changing during the training. Moving from, again, what is fairly typical from other NeuroSky readings I do, uh, short of alpha being high here, which it's a, at its highest point, that right there you see is the low alpha and even the uh, high alpha. Those, those are a bit higher in the beginning than they are anywhere through else anywhere else throughout the session. But what's most interesting, again, from this 10 minutes to 15 minutes, there's a definite compression of the brainwave pattern and a suppression of delta and theta and an increase in gamma, increase in high beta. I'm delivering SMR frequencies as stimulation. So I would expect those to be higher, and they are. They are, in fact. Um, let's just look at those as a structure and get out of the dictation mode here, or the annotation mode, and let's just look at the low beta by itself which is being stimulated all right so there's the stimulation periods back to annotation mode all right so from here to here I'm getting higher increases now this range has changed to only show 50% of the overall range of the EEG graph. But getting increased beta here. And then during the rest period, it's, it's really actually still high, higher than it was. But during the second training is when it really starts to come up. So the second training, I'm actually responding more strongly to the beta stimulation and during the rest period I let that go and we're delivering theta frequencies during that time which we'll look at in a moment but those go down however soon as we pop back up again notice quite a bit of difference in the amount of beta during the third training period quite a bit of beta then it drops off now notice here's this drop off point all right here's the drop off point where we dropped out of our attention values now I'll show that but we'll have to let me escape that we'll have to toggle back and forth to see it so let's look at this area right here because this is during a training period where the beta drops so between 23 and 24 minutes well between 23 and 24 minutes our attention value drops almost following it exactly so that's interesting that's telling us that the attention is reading beta which is why I'm stimulating beta at least somewhat now you can't say that the algorithm completely is reading beta but we can see a relationship between those now does that carry forth let's look at these areas of low beta between 18 minutes and 21 minutes well, yes, there you go. Beta's dropping down. So, they there's another correlation. Let's look at the between 7 and 8 minutes and see what that tells us. Okay, now it's not quite as clear, 
between the seven and eight minutes because it's a lower overall pattern. But as that brainwave starts to have a structured pattern throughout the session, you can begin to see these correlations. Let's look at these low areas. Now, this is during theta stimulation. All right, so it may not correlate quite as much, but let's see. Well, it turns out that it does, though. It does correlate a bit. So, to some degree, the attention algorithm is measuring SMR beta. And this is the type of thing we want to discover, is not only how to tilt the attention algorithm in our favor to get higher scores during our training, but also what it means to have higher attention and how we can train ourselves to do that. So you can see the value of what we are attempting to do. Let's look at theta. All right. Theta, again, has that high period throughout the session, so we pretty much disregard this because, again, for me, this is a relatively normal type of brain pattern. Um, what I'm interested in is the changing brainwave pattern throughout the session, all right? But let's look at our rest periods, all right? So here we are, and let's actually look at a more interesting rest period. So let's look between 18 and 20 minutes. Let's compare that to our attention. So between 18 and 20 minutes, again, we're at a low attention value. And we're also kind of at a low theta value, but we have this theta spike at about 18 and a half. So let's see what that looks like at around 18 and a half. So a big attention drop off here, in fact the biggest of the entire session, occurs at the same time that theta spikes. So there might be an inverse correlation between those values. So let's look at a high theta spike, which this is right at the end of the third training period where I lost focus essentially right here what does that tell us on the attention level that's at about 24 just under so 24 we have a drop here significant drop but I think this one actually I think this area right here actually correlates more. So we had a significant drop and then we came up. up. So we're seeing this kind of structured pattern here. So theta popped up as attention went down. Now we are stimulating theta during these sessions. However, my goal during that is not to try to entrain to the theta, but to relax, just to let go. So maybe that makes somewhat of a difference. You can see the theta is a bit elevated during that time, but the delta was too. And they kind of are alternating which is interesting. The theta delta comes up, then the theta comes up, then the delta pops up. And so you could study these relationships. The point is that we now have both the attention data and the actual EEG data to compare it against. So let me turn these back on. And let's see, I changed my, turn off the tension, rotate my graph a little. 
not that much. Hello, crazy thing. Yeah. Ah, uh, actually, let me just. Sometimes it's easier just to reset the view. All right. And I want to rotate it slightly. Okay. So what we're interested in, though, is these changing brainwave patterns. Come on, dude. Not so much. My, I'm sorry. My screen is updating slower because I'm recording video. And so it, it's kind of hard to set the graph just where I want it because I'm getting a little bit of latency. And sometimes it's better to look at this stuff in the flat range. The 3D looks nice, but the flat range is sometimes easier to read. So we are interested, once again, in this brainwave pattern. This brainwave pattern works really good for keeping the attention high. Our attention was high during that brainwave pattern. So potentially we want to train for this and then we want to look for it in other types of sessions where we may not be just a training attention or focus but we're wanting to look at a brainwave that's similar to this which is a definite decrease of data uh, of delta and theta and an increase of gamma just the whole brainwave pattern is compressed and it's very distinctive it's very distinctive in this session and again more data will help as you gather more and more data on yourself you'll know what represents your idealized brainwave states and then you can continue to train for those so I would suspect that over time using this session my abilities to concentrate and maintain focus maybe burst through that four minute barrier and try to increase that to ten minutes or what have you um, and then also testing if different times of day make a difference, if different stimulation instead of just speak value makes a difference. I mean, this is an ongoing self-study project um, that you can undertake with Mind Workstation. But I hope overall that these videos have shown you how to pull all the elements together in Mind Workstation using biosensors, using the advanced tools in Mind Workstation to create a self-study system, a training system, and some goals that you can base that training on in, in the desire to increase your thinking skills or, or better uh, your abilities to control certain states of consciousness that may be desirable toward you. So this will be the uh, last point of this video. And I hope that you'll uh, pick up a lot of things from it. And you'll see the value of Mind Workstation along with biosensors. And we'll be training you on how to design these sessions for yourself and how to best utilize the tools that are available in Mind Workstation as well as the affordable biosensors that have become available on the market. So this is Scott Hendrickson. Take care.